I guess we are live on air. Yes, sir. To, uh, change from red to green. Now, man. And now call the uh, meeting, this uh, work, special workshop meeting of the council to order. We have a proposed agenda here uh, before us. Uh, one of the items is included, is, is included is a closed session, so I'd entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Carry none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. All right. Uh, I'm going to turn it. The, the first item. Meeting time. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> the five o'clock special is coming through. Uh, we have the uh, first item is discussion of the Commons Park area, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Woodruff, at this time. Mayor, members of council, welcome back. We hope you've had a good summer so far. Uh, today we have uh, several items we're going to be discussing in workshop. We would like to try to get through the first two items by 6 o'clock, so then you can go into closed session relative to two other items. Relative to the commons, we have two discussions. One is Richard Ray Park, and the other is the commons acreage. As you will recall, back last year, or maybe even in 2013, the City Council approved the sale of a little over two acres of land to uh, Marine Chevrolet. That was to enable them to expand their facilities, and in exchange for that, they paid the City $337,000. You'll also remember that the requirement as part of the sale was that they would create a retention lake that could actually be an amenity and that that retention lake would actually have to be designed large enough to contain their storm water from additional surface areas that they were putting in, but also it would be large enough to handle storm water from any parking lots that we built in the future in the Richard Ray Park area. One of the concepts which we sent you some information several weeks ago was that part of the agreement is that the dirt that is dug out belongs to the city. And so one of the suggestions is, why not build an amphitheater out of that dirt? The agreement says that the dirt will be placed somewhere on site, mutually agreeable. So what we'd like to do is talk with you a moment about what you could create. You can see in the graphic, the blue is the water. And yes, that is definitely Carolina blue water. Uh, the brown would be a tiered amphitheater. The amenity lake would also have a viewing wall. If you look basically in the middle of the upper part, you can see something that is uh, very angular. That is a viewing wall where the water will be several feet deep year-round. So that wedge that's created can be made into a hard surface area so that you can put musical instruments, bands, singing groups, performing groups in that area. The brown area represents a series of tiers that we're proposing to build. For aeration purposes, but also for beautification purposes, we would like to install a floating fountain. It would be different than the fountain that's fixed in Lake Bittner. This would be a floating fountain that we could turn on and off, and we could actually move it from one location of the lake to another. The amphitheater would basically be a series of tiers. Each tier would be two feet higher than the former tier. Each tier would basically be 10 feet from front to back so that you would have natural elevations creating, or I should say man-made elevations, creating the amphitheater. The back part, of course, has to be sloped so that it doesn't just fall straight off. And you can see the amount of territory that this covers. We've actually gone out with Parker and Associates and with our engineering staff and have staked the area. And this is to scale, so you can see how much area the amphitheater takes up. And it does take up a lot of area. We believe that it can seat somewhere in the vicinity of 300 to 400 people. There would also be walking paths and lighting that would connect the various parts of Richard Ray Park to the amphitheater and to the lake area. And then again, parking. This is an example of the tiered system. While our thought was that we would do roughly 10 feet per level, this is an example in another community 
where you can see the cap for the wall creates a seated area. In some of the other areas, you could put blankets or put out more chairs, but that's the concept we're dealing with. The budget we're looking at is $337,000. You have not earmarked this money for this project. When you sold the land to the Marine Chevrolet, you set the money aside for a future project. It is not part of your four cents. It did not go into your general fund reserve. It is a special reserve account. Actual competitive bids have been received by Marine Chevrolet with addendums to that that would create these elements. And you can see to actually create the amphitheater, including grassing, now that's not sod, that is just grass seed, is $72,000. The other elements, such as the lighting, the extension of the electricity, a fountain, those type things, 65000 And then if you did those two elements, you would have roughly 200000 for future parking or for something else in this or some other location. Mr. Parker is to the point where he is ready to direct the contractor for the work for the private side. What we're asking for you this evening is to consider approving the construction elements or direct that we spend the money for parking only or that we do no elements at this time and keep the money secure or some other option. So again, what we're discussing is the possibility of, let me go back to the amphitheater, creating this in this location. Uh, Greg and Deanna have done a good job helping us uh, come up with the statistics and the design. We would like to open it to discussion and get direction from you. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm not clear. Uh, is there like a stage or something that you would use? No, what you'd actually use is the flat surface of the ground where you would put in a hard surface such as a concrete what, cap. Where, where at? Not sure Let me see if I am capable of doing a pointer. Okay. Well, the pointer doesn't show on that screen. I will, if you don't mind, I'll simply point to it this way, Mayor. It would be right in this area. You can see the wall here. This would become the performance area. <laughs> but, you know, this would be the performance area. People could put additional chairs in this. You can see the contours beginning with the various levels going up. Can you, can you give us more detail on the parking element? Yes. The parking element, uh, the master plan actually calls for some parking to be installed where the word walking for walking path is. Also, at the current parking across from Lake Bittner, you can expand that by about 15 additional spaces. The majority of future parking, though, is back over at the top left of the screen under the word common where you see the white <coughs> dirt. That's where your real future parking would go. Now, the question whether you would actually build that parking as an asphalt parking lot or whether it would be simply a harder surface where you would have grass uh, and I will tell you, you know, $200,000 will get you some of that parking, but it will not get you all of that parking in asphalt. So how many spaces would you do here on, on the side? The, uh, I'll have to check. Uh, Greg, do you remember what the master plan? It was uh, about 20 spaces. It wasn't so a large minimal. number. You know, there were about 15 spaces added at the top where the current parking is, about 20 along the side and then the rest of it, depending on how much money you wanted to expend and what surface you wanted to put in on it. So, But that's a concept. Uh, at the end of the day, if you decide that you want to move forward with this, we can approve the bid. If you decide you do not want to move forward with this, then they will deposit the dirt on site, and over a period of months, we will have to decide what we will do with it. So in the event of some major event there, you're planning on utilizing the existing parking in the commons. Correct. Commons and recreation area. Yes, and if you also remember, uh, when events are being, when events are occurred in non-business hours, the agreement allows us to use the hard surface parking that uh, Marine Chevrolet is putting in on the property that they purchased from us. <coughs> if, if we 
if there's any available. Yes, if they're if it's available, they're they're welcome to use it. So. Can you describe the seating a little bit more? Help me understand what's. I mean, I saw that one picture. Okay. And that's what we're thinking. We're thinking uh, something very similar. Look at the largest level. Because what we did was design this where they would come up basically two feet so people could see over each other, and then there'd simply be a flat grassed area. That way you could bring your own lawn chairs and you could sit there. We're not going to be going to the expense of putting in seating so that people could spread blankets, they could bring lawn chairs, but by having it tiered, you're able to see over the person in front of you. And of course, with the amphitheater down on the ground, uh, it would be also, uh, I mean, that's that would be the amphitheater concept. In time, we could go uh, a little fancier by putting in what, they, what this picture shows, by actually putting in uh, a vertical seat made out of stone or something like that. But that's not in the initial phase of work. That area there is fairly high and not prone to flooding. Oh, yes, sir. It's very. It's it's not flown to to flooding. The flooding part. Let me go back a second. The natural. If you'll notice, there is a heavy dark line that comes from the W in walking down to the P in park and then down to the F. That's the natural drainage ditch. But this area here does not flood. And the fountain has been, or the lake has been designed so that it can be uh, contained with water year-round. It is not a, a detention facility that will uh, be without water. And I'm sure if we got into a California drought, we may see something like that. But, uh, Where are the closest bathrooms to this amphitheater, or would we have to construct bathrooms inside it? The closest bathrooms are actually just off of the top of the parking lot, but you would really not use those bathrooms for for this type of activity. You would most likely bring in temporary bathrooms that are known as porta johns, and uh, you would probably line those up somewhere uh, along the paths as people come in, just like we do for any festival. Uh, we had not envisioned building a bathroom house at this location. Um, but the ba existing bathrooms aren't really that far from this site. They're not too far away. I mean, uh, if you look uh, from the walking there, maybe Probably 100 in the yards. Area of the, where the word area is? is Just above it, yeah, but, uh, by yeah. the end of the parking lot there. Okay. The, the bands on that small bathroom wouldn't, for, for something like this, wouldn't, I don't, I don't think it would handle it. You would definitely need to bring in. If you were having a, a, a good concert there, and again, you know, the concept would be that we would open this up to uh, anything from. Uh, high school groups that are trying to raise money. It's the same concept we talked about at Phillips Park, but as you will recall, because of the problems at Phillips Park, we have no idea, you know, it could be five years, it, it could be longer. I know in one of the transmittals that Mr. Warden has sent me regarding this when I sent you the concept several weeks ago, you know, he asked about uh, how long would it take and at a minimum five years for this to be built at Phillips Park. You do not have to build this here. What we're showing you, though, is that uh, this is an opportunity to bring a new amenity there. If we don't build that, then we are going to have to determine what do we do with the dirt over time. Short time, it will simply be stockpiled. Now, the other thing that we would mention to you, it is not a decision that you absolutely have to make tonight. Mr. Parker would love to uh, sign the contract tomorrow morning, but we know you've been on vacation. If you would like to have an opportunity to personally visit the site, you're welcome, and we can certainly put this back on the next workshop for further direction. Just well, well, Richard Ray, yeah. as most of you know, was a real <clears throat> community leader, uh, provided for some good developmental planning for the area, and it was a real tragedy when he was taken away from us so, so early. Uh, we raised, in fact, I led part of the effort to raise funds through public donation for this particular park. It's never materialized as I had it envisioned, but that's neither here nor there. But the family itself, I believe, has contributed heavily mm -hmm. to further amenities. And I think it's a marvelous addition to 
the Richard Ray Park area. I'd make a motion that we go ahead with the project as, as proposed. Second. Okay, any discussion? Just a couple questions. Uh, uh, the, the, the G in parking, uh, that, that parcel on the other side of the road, is that, is that city owned? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What is what are, what do we what have we master plan for that area? Playing fields. And what we'll do is uh, in just a moment we're going to show you an aerial of all of those. So if you don't mind, let me jump forward to another slide in the next presentation, and I can show you all of the city land. Okay. The blue area is the area you were just <coughs> referring to. This is a graphic, as, as you will recall, earlier this summer, uh, we talked with you about the fact we were, uh, we had let the wetland jurisdictionals expire on all of the commons property. We worked with Mr. Parker and with uh, Hayward Pittman and with your staff, and what we've done over the spring was to come in and cut out all the undergrowth in the uh, number seven area up there, which is green in my eye, the number four area, which is kind of a purple or pink, uh, and in the number eight area, which is green, and the number nine a, nine a area behind the tennis courts. We did that so that we could open it up, let it dry out, have better aeration, and then we brought in the folks from the Corps of Engineers, and as I mentioned to you probably three, three weeks ago by email, we have gotten a very, very favorable jurisdictional. So for the next five years, you have a permit that basically says you can use all of that colored property for development. Not that we have plans to develop it in five years. There, is, there are slivers of, um, of creek bed, if you want to call them that, or ditch bed that are jurisdictional, but they are very narrow. At most, they're 20, 25 feet wide, and they're basically your drainage ditches. So you could not have wound up with a better situation than what the jurisdictionals have. Once the jurisdictionals are given, we have our calendars marked because before it expires after five years, and believe me, they're on Carmen's calendar, they're on John's calendar, they're on the manager's calendar, they're on Greg's calendar, they're on Susan Baptist's calendar, we will file for another five-year extension. So realistically, for the next 10 years, you have the potential for developing your property. And that is important because if we hadn't gotten in there with Michael's folks and with Pete's folks and really cleaned up the forest, you would have lost that. And once it gets designated wetland, you really don't get it back. So the area, going back to your question, the area in green is an area that uh, the city did not have a master plan specifically for. The area in blue, number three, that is the area that you deeded to the county for a library. As of March of 2015, that deed reverted back to you because the deed said that if the library was not completed, by March the 13th of 2015, it would automatically revert back to the city. That's an undeveloped block, correct? It's undeveloped. So that's that undeveloped block where we have currently what we call Jacksonville Challenge or the, the Commons Challenge course. As you come around towards Mr. Bittner's house and towards the water tank, all of that is undeveloped. The same thing with the parcels that are around the recreation facilities. Number 10 down here, which you were asking about, that's the area that they proposed for additional ball fields, multi-purpose fields. And that would also include some additional parking. Number nine, if you take number nine C up to where the existing parking lot is, that's the area that the transit folks have been trying to get a grant to expand as an off-site parking area we, we actually have funding and we're in the process of completing the next step of the approval but our, our we can use funding from our annual grant to build that park and ride we just have to complete the preliminary paperwork uh, and then finish the design so that's in the CIP right now that parking would be available for events in the Commons area that's during correct. during weekends and on the evenings yes, and so yes, forth that's correct 
a little help here, uh, one of it to help me clarify. The roadway, the proposed, I mean, the future road network that may involve that area, where, where would it cut? Where would it trans? Uh, more slides on that. that. Actually, that's <laughs> the second part of the discussion. So let's let's look at that second part. Before we leave this part, this next discussion really is talking about your property when the commons were the commons area was purchased by the city there were properties that obviously have been developed also there were properties that you had thoughts of how you would use but like anything in life you know time changes it if you look at western boulevard and if you'll notice down on the bottom right you can see where the commons acreage is it's in green Amazingly enough, everything in red all the way out to Gum Branch, where the new Lowe's is, that's now developed. And if you look at everything that's in blue, that is either currently under construction or we have a site plan in the permitting office for them to develop. What you'll notice is the majority of the green property is up there in the vicinity of where D.R. Horton wanted to build uh, that subdivision that they did not move forward with for various reasons. And you can also see that it is up in the apartment complex area. You asked the question, where is the Jacksonville Parkway going to go? The red line at the bottom, of course, is the existing parkway. The blue area is the city acreage <coughs> that is in that parcel where the library and out to Western Boulevard. The hatched yellow is the potential route for the extension of Jacksonville Parkway. At this point, I'll introduce the handsome and talented Anthony Prince. Anthony, come on up. I'd like to have Anthony talk to you about the schedule for the building of the extension of Jacksonville Parkway that the MPO has been working on. Please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, Jacksonville Parkway extension is one of our highest priorities at this point. And truly, the intent with the parkway is to finish the bypass, so to speak. Um, the bypass was intended to be a bypass of US 17. But currently, it, it ends at uh, Western Boulevard at Gateway North and really doesn't connect back over to Highway 17. So the intent with Jacksonville Parkway is to do that. Um, right now, the project is scheduled in the TIP for 2024. So it's, it's not an immediate construction project, but we do anticipate that it'll be in that next tier for, for funding and construction. Many of you have noticed the congestion on Jacksonville Parkway already at Western, and that's actually a good thing, because only by having congestion do you move your projects up on the funding list for the future. So sometime, you know, in the mid-20s, you will see Jacksonville Parkway built. Now, why is that important for this discussion? Jacksonville Parkway is going to split your property. What you will wind up with is city land that is used for recreation on one side and city land on the other side. The green parcel adjacent to the blue parcel is owned by McRae, the McRae family. They actually own a piece that goes all the way back, way back uh, to where it connects to uh, other owners but it really wraps around the Jacksonville Commons to a substantial degree. I would also remind you, and again, I apologize for pointing, but I will. The annotation is on. Yeah, and I'm going to let you annotate. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do with annotation? I think you just touch it with your finger, okay. actually. I will remind you that while this property, I have the golden finger, it's not working. <laughs> it worked up there. Touch it worked yeah. up there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is basically, I'm sorry, this is basically the McRae property line. This property up here is the 227 acres that 
a partnership deeded to the city three or four years ago. Now, it's true, a lot of that area up there is wet. It's also true there's about 75 acres of pods that is upland, and in the future you may decide to build an environmental park up there, but really that back part that's in the circle is not going to be for development. You own it, it is something that with wetland delineations on it, it's really going to stay pretty natural. The developer of the green parcel has come to us and is currently talking about developing a major shopping center at this location. I believe it has around 120,000 square feet. It's a large shopping area. What it will also do is have an impact on traffic. The hash lines that are here have to do with the transportation master plan. Anthony? So the, the two different types of lines, we have a narrow yellow hash line and then we have a thicker yellow hash line. Uh, when we see a development of this size and of course when we're doing planning for the city as a whole, we look at connectivity, right? Because connectivity is how we disperse traffic and avoid congestion and also open up areas for future development. So the, the wider hashed line, there are roads that we're proposing to facilitate regional travel. So these will be public streets, like the extension of Jacksonville Parkway, which is shown here. How'd you do that? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> but then also an extension of Henderson Drive, which is shown here. As I mentioned before, Jacksonville Parkway is funded on the TIP and we expect to see that under construction somewhere in the mid 20s, hopefully earlier 20s if at all possible. Uh, but Henderson Drive unfortunately did not make the cut and is not funded on the TIP, but that remains a, a relatively high priority for, for transportation in Jacksonville and certainly for this area. Uh, the other type of connectivity that we look for is uh, localized connectivity things that are not public roads to speak, but are interconnections between parcels. Uh, we see that a lot on, on Western Boulevard, like in the Target area and elsewhere, where you have those baggage roads that aren't, like I mentioned, aren't, necess aren't necessarily public streets, but they do move traffic on an alternate route to Western Boulevard. So in this particular area, we're looking at a backage road to Western Boulevard, which is spaced accordingly to prevent congestion at this location. We want to avoid the Gateway South situation in the future, uh, but then also provides additional connectivity internal to the development and back towards uh, what we would hope to see as Henderson Drive extension at some point. And if you have been up to the new development there at Henderson, where you have the urgent care and you have First Bank, which I'm sure many of you will be attending their open house, I believe it's Thursday of this week. Uh, is it next week? Thursday. This week. Thursday. Uh, you can already see that extension of that parallel road. The developer is required by your UDO to have that connection. So as they develop the green parcel, your UDO, Unified Development Ordinance, will require them to put in that connection. The red line is intended to be Jacksonville Parkway as it eventually gets built. The green parcel is the McRae property, which we're talking about being developed shortly. The yellow lines are the lines that they are proposing for their interconnectivity. If you'll notice, one of the yellow lines crosses the city property. Now, in our discussions with them, they are, they are in agreement that if the city provides the right-of-way, that they will build the road to city specifications, they will extend water and sewer to that road, so that in the future, if the city decides to develop its property, we will have a road built by others. We will have water and sewer available to developable parcels. Does the annotator work? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. sir. 
let me see if my left hand will work. The right hand wouldn't. If you notice, there is a property line here. That is an out parcel owned by Mr. Witcher. The city has not ever owned that. We have contacted John Pierce, who is a representative for Mr. Richard, about possibly donating that property to the city. That property has some higher developable portions here, but this area in through here has some substantial drainage issues. So the possibility of Mr. Richard getting a development permit to fill the ditch which is a substantial ditch. It's not just four or five feet, it's more like 20 feet. That is, is not really good. If they were to develop, I'm sorry, if they were to donate that property to the city, and if a frontage road was built, or backage road as, as uh, Anthony called it, was built, you would have the potential for several, at least one good, maybe two, developable lots here utilizing the frontage road utilizing your property and property which Mr. Wichard may be willing he hasn't agreed to it yet donate to the city you have to look at this property I'm sorry let me say it differently I'm encouraging you to look at this property as an investment group while you're certainly the mayor and council of the city, you are responsible for the assets and determining how those assets should be utilized. Going back one slide again, Jacksonville Parkway is going to split your property. The concept of having recreation activities over here and recreation activities over here might work if they were really independent recreational activities. So if you built a splash, a water park, a major water park in here, that would be one thing. But if you had ball fields in here with other activities over here, you would not want to encourage, because of the traffic volume that Jacksonville Parkway is going to generate, you would not want to have recreation facilities on both sides. So part of the discussion, and it's not a discussion that we are asking you to conclude tonight, we're asking you to begin to think from an investment standpoint about the possibility of extending this road through your property at others' expense, and in the days ahead, considering what do you want to do with your larger acreage that's going to be split with Jacksonville Parkway. We have not done an appraisal on our property. We have done appraisal though, we did conduct an appraisal on the property that you sold to the Marine Chevrolet. At the time you sold that, acreage in this area was selling for well over a half a million dollars. I have no idea, I was not here when you bought the commons or when your, your uh, predecessors bought the commons. Does anybody know what you bought the commons for, all 160-something acres? I think it was $400,000. You have the potential, I'm not saying you should, actually I am saying you should, but you'll decide that. You have the potential to sell this in this area for easily six to eight million dollars what it will mean, though, is it will move from a recreation holding to an asset with the city that you can do other things with. So, for example, going back to the large picture that we started with, if you were to sell the green parcel, you could, develop, you could use that money to finish the rest of the development plan for the commons. I mean, you, you have to look at it from an investment standpoint that you have investments and how are you going to use them? At one time, there was the thought that you would build the water plant on the green property. I would say to you when you decided not to do that, that was a wise decision because it gives you this 
opportunity to look down the road and decide what do you want to do. From a timing standpoint, you have uh, a lot of information that we've given you tonight on two projects that we don't expect you to come to a conclusion on. What we're doing, though, is asking you to spend some time over the next several weeks, and we can have this discussion further if you would like. Yes, sir. I got I got one thing to continue. I've got a motion and a second out there that we still have to do. So, uh, Council, is there any other discussion on that matter? The only discussion I have, Mayor, is that uh, I'm not opposed to the project. I would, I would just prefer a little more detail into exactly <coughs> what your vision is in, in the construction process, and you know what the maintenance implications are going to be. I, for me. I think it's a great idea. It's a great location. We probably should reinvest the money back into that park. But I, I, to make that decision, I would prefer a little bit more detail on what what we plan on building. The reason I say that is I go back to the bridge, and we didn't know we were getting a patina bridge. So a little more detail would be nice. Well, the, just so you'll be uh, at ease, uh, any bridges we built out there, we will paint. So, <laughs> I think so. it was just but we can give you, we can certainly give you a lot more detail. And the conversation you're talking about is relative to the Richard Ray Park portion. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We're still kind of talking about that, the amphitheater. Right? The amphitheater. The amphitheater. I'm not <coughs> opposed to it, just a little more detail would make it more palatable. Further discussion? Just a quick question. What was the size? What was our proposed seating for the Phillips Park Amphitheater? Do you remember? Was it 500? I think it was about three to 500. Is that the same size as we're talking about here? I think you said I think, 400. I think the three, they're saying three to 400, so roughly the same size. You know, there, there is no question we're putting a lot into that park. I mean, there's no, no getting around that. Uh, the one thing is that because of the opportunity of the lake, it gives you a great backdrop for the amphitheater. Uh, I'm not giving up uh, on our hope that one day we're going to be able to redevelop Phillips Park and add some good activities there. I can assure you of that. Yeah, yeah I, I guess that was one of my concerns is that we were, I didn't want to put up, put all of our eggs in one basket in one big, big park. I wanted, I, you know, certain areas, uh, over in Kerr Street, that's that's a nice neighborhood park, and we need neighborhood parks. We certainly need a regional park, but uh, you know, on the other hand, we're, if we do this, we're not giving up on Phillips Park, as you just said. We we can certainly do something else there. We may decide to put another amphitheater in if the first one is successful. Uh, it, you know, who knows what five years down the road will bring us. Uh, so. Um, you know, we still have the what I would consider the the, uh, the Sturgeon City Park over there. That's that in my mind is still undeveloped, relatively undeveloped. Well, you're right about that, and that actually brings me to my last slide on this part. I appreciate the intro. On that. I, did, I, did, I still need to deal with one thing at a time here. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 sorry. <laughs> we're, pushing, we're pushing this through a little too quickly. <laughs> We still have a motion in a, in a second that we have on the floor here that we need to deal with, and we need to we need to hold a discussion of that for the moment, for the time being. You know, if I'm gonna support that, I'm gonna be a little reluctant. I mean, it's not that I'm against it. I'm just. Uh, would it be would it be objective if we postponed it to the next workshop to vote on to have more information? What's going to be gained by it? Seems to me that you're talking about the details of the construction. Well, like we're talking about micromanaging the well, project. Well, it seems like we're approving a conceptual development that we really don't really Well, he know. could always bring the plans back. Or the plans are in the hands of the <clears throat> contractor now? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you know, on the, on the other hand, uh, the, the dirt's going to be there, and we either can use it or we have an expense to move it somewhere else to use it. So... But we will definitely bring back uh, the details, I mean, whether you approve it tonight or whether you want to postpone it to, to another meeting, but we will definitely bring back, you, bring, back you, bring back to you the details so that you'll approve of the type fountain we're putting in, the 
type of grass, any hard surfaces we're putting in, those type of things. We'll I just want to make around. sure that it's a hard figure that, that we're being presented in terms of actual cost. Are well, those actually costs? are bid figures. Okay. I mean, Mr. Right, Morton figures. was the low bidder. Isn't that correct, Deanna? Yeah. Mr. Morton was the low, low bidder on those, and those are hard costs. The only difference would be the 200,000 is, is a mushy number. I mean, it's a real number, but we don't know what that equates to in regard to the amount of parking that we can get out of that. That's correct. But, but again, some of the parking will be provided by the other project, the park and ride project. It's a, it's a nice project. Uh, we, we, I think we're all in agreement we would like to see an amphitheater concept somewhere in Jacksonville. Anybody else have any discussion on this matter? All right. All those in favor of motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Let me see. Hands. Okay. All opposed? All right. Motion carries. Okay, Mayor, is it all right if I go to my last slide now, sir? <laughs> yes, you <laughs> can. <laughs> Knock yourself out. <laughs> What's coming up on, on your parks for future workshops include the following. Uh, the Parkwood property, uh, JASA, has made certain improvements. They want to give you an update on their program and some of the needs that they have. We have scheduled that for August the 18th. We're also going to be talking to you about the former fire station on Barn Street. You know that the Children's Museum has asked uh, to be first in line for that facility. We're going to be talking to you about Williamsburg Plantation and the 16 or 17 acres you have over there. We actually have some folks who, who have some uh, thoughts that they'd like to have you consider. Uh, Branchwood Park, what are we going to be doing in there in the future? Uh, Northeast Creek Park, we still have the boardwalk over there that we have not addressed. Uh, we also have some other renovation plans that you'll be seeing in the next uh, several uh, workshops. Jacksonville Landing Phase 2, that's basically to build the bathhouse and so forth that's left uh, for that and the Welcome Center. Uh, Ann Street Waterfront, we'll be giving you an update on the work that John has been doing with the County Commission relative to the, uh, the conversion. conservation conversion. Conversion. The conversion. Thank you. Uh, and we're also going to be talking to you about the Onslow <laughs> Insight and trying to get some direction from you as to what you want us to do. Uh, on continuing to hold that property or seek out development potential. And then, as you mentioned, Sturgeon City. We plan on bringing you a report uh, within the next uh, week. I believe, Glenn, this is coming Friday. You're in Raleigh on Sturgeon City. Conference. You're in a conference call on Sturgeon City. That sure beats driving to Raleigh. So, but. Uh, what about the uh, Kerr Street Marina? Is that. That's going to be something we're going to discuss in just a couple of months. Oh, okay, okay. I have something that one of the closed session things. What about the park on the end of Audubon, in which I've got a couple of calls from? That's Branchwood. Yeah. That's Branchwood Park. Okay. And uh, what we're going to be uh, giving you a briefing on is uh, and we have, as, as you probably know from the conversations and from the email I sent out last week, uh, that is a park that uh, is not utilized the way it once was. The neighborhood has changed uh, because of the four acres there and the amount of grass cutting. Uh, I made a decision. If you want to reverse it, it's not going to hurt my feelings. But uh, we have cut back on the amount of maintenance in that park so that we can give more attention to the roadway mowing. And I will be sending a letter out this week to each of the residents on Audubon explaining what we are doing there. But uh, I mean, that, is, that is a park that is not very utilized except by maybe two or three families. Uh, we had one gentleman tell Michael that it is really more like a private park and that he really enjoys it. Well, there's a lot of mowing that goes on every week there for, uh, for the limited utilization. So we will be discussing the future of Branchwood with you. What would we do? Just let it return to nature? If for the moment, I think your options are that uh, you know we would simply either reduce the area that we mow so that you still have some play area there, but you don't have four acres, or you could consider declaring it surplus at some point and deciding do you want to sell all or none of that property. The recreation master plan questioned Branchwood as it did two or three other small parks, saying 
you know, it's not big enough to to be really used, but it's too big and it's not used that that much. So we will be uh, having more discussions with okay. you on that. Mayor, that concludes uh, those two items. Uh, what I would like to ask you to do relative to that frontage road is think about the frontage road crossing the commons area. Think about that and we will put that back on your agenda for uh, the next workshop for you to give us some direction relative to having the developer extend a frontage road across there. Let's talk about the cray. Uh, yes, the next item will be Glenn giving you an update on tourism. So I'll yield my seat. And Good evening. Um, obviously, um, the Mayor Pro Tem is the chairman of the authority, and so um, he's asked me to give you a little bit of a briefing this evening as to what some of the actions are of the authority and some update just basically to some of the work that's being going forward here. What we're going to talk about is a little bit about strategy and what the strategy is for the Tourism Development Authority as adopted. The, um, one of the things to just start with there is obviously some of the background that some of you lived through, obviously, that um, on August 6, 2009, after talking about it for many, many years, we finally got an occupancy tax. And when the legislature passed that um, Senate Bill 80, um, it was a great benefit to us and has allowed us to be involved in many things that we wouldn't ordinarily be involved in. And to the end of that, um, you folks adopted um, some ordinances back on March the 2nd of um, 2010 um, after we went and talked with several different organizations that were running um, um, occupancy taxes, and we got some advice and counsel for them and um, put together a plan um, during that time. And um, on July the 1st, 2010, is when we started collecting um, the occupancy tax, and we've been doing so ever since then as it was. Toward the end of that, um, the, the authority has wanted to talk about what its strategy could be to put more heads on beds. Because after all, that enabling legislation that was there said that everything you do has to do to benefit Jacksonville lodging facilities. That is the heads on beds mantra that is um, used to discuss and to make forward with what happens in the authority. So one of the things was, was to create a brand of Jacksonville so that people would speak and know about Jacksonville in a way that um, we felt would um, entice them to come here. Because after all, a brand is what people say about you when they're not talking to you. So that's the, how they look and feel and, and what, what they'd like to see happen. So North Star um, was a firm that we brought in to do this. They have done destination marketing all over the United States and they are very well known and very much appreciated for that. And they do use research, um, they do have creativity in, in what, I, what they do, and of course they put together a strategy for us that let us um, um, evolve into what it is that we're doing now as it is. So after they went through those four-step process, they did a remarkable number of studies, and we have an incredibly thick book of, of the results of those studies that were done. Um, they took about six months to do so. Among the things they do is they go to other communities that might be feeder communities to us. They go to communities that, um, that live around us and ask what that brand is, what, what we think about those other communities and what do they think about us. And so there was a, there was a lot of soul searching in some of the comments that came back from that as it was. So at the end of the day, we had to decide how we're going to get more of the people who come here um, to, to, to do that again. What, what could we do to potentially extend their stay and do things like that? And what we found was that of the people who stay here, 60% of them are visiting their loved ones. And as we like to say, we can't make them come because if they don't have a loved one to come, they're not going to come, or if they choose not to come, they're not going to come. We can't induce a, a mother to come see her son or the father to come see his daughter. Um, unless they want to do that, as it was. But we can make them feel welcome once they come here. Now, in the other category, it was divided between business, sports, which definitely moves the meter, and temporary work um, that we've seen in here. And I think some of us in this room probably know better than the rest of us that um, in 2010, there was a lot different market than what it is now insofar as what's using the facilities and such there. I will say back then we had less than 2,000 rooms, and now we have about 2,200. Um, rooms out there. 
Now, from that study that came back with some insights was obviously um, the military, the duh moment for us, and we all knew that. That's what was driving the stays as it was. We were well perceived as a community, though, that cared about others and had emphasized um, providing that, 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 that care and that continuum of care um, to even those people who stay in our hotels. And there was a great deal that they found in the focus groups they did amongst the people in Jacksonville that there was a great deal of pride in what was already here and how we treat military and how we are so proud to be the home of them as it was. So the brand platform is a very structured um, um, pr um, presentation that is used to help build your strategy and is used to also help you and develop what type of advertising or what type of promotion you should be doing. And the target audience is that it says for those who are seeking to express their love of country, Jacksonville, North Carolina, home to the largest Marine Corps base on the East Coast, Camp Lejeune, is where celebrating those who serve honors the freedom they provide so you can return home filled with deep pride in the past and great hope for the future. And that is at our brand platform and has us differentiating ourselves from other communities. At the same time, it gives that frame of reference as something that you all know that what exists here and the benefit that would come from you staying here and visiting in Jacksonville. The brand narrative is a long document, and we've shared that in your, um, in your iLegislate too, and we have that so that you can look at it. It's a rather um, detailed um, presentation of what the type of feeling is that you can get to it. But it also sets the mode for receive a hero's welcome, which is the strap line that was developed by the authority to embody that feeling that you get, that military, caring community, pride. That is all contained within receive a hero's welcome. The, the group was very reluctant to use the word hero until it came to be, it's a welcome, much like a hero would receive. And you're going to see how that plays out in some of the things that have been done. And the logo, the mark of the Tourism Development Authority, was something that we have seen that embodies the pride we have in the military. After all, you folks helped to dedicate the Freedom Fountain to all those who come through Onzo County in service to their nation. What better icon has it become for the city of Jacksonville to stand as a is a, some tangible entry that says that's what it is. And I think you'll all agree, it certainly has caught the eye of the public, and it's certainly something that's represented outside of our community as a symbol of our community. Now, the strategy that the Tourism Development Authority has developed has been premised on the fact that we have a bill that requires us to spend two-thirds of the funding on promotion and one-third of what's left um, in the other. Um, Gail Mates loves to um, talk about our pink and green money, and um, Alan Weeks is here this evening to ensure that we properly speak to that end as it was there. So the strategy was built around a couple of components. One, build. Things that people can visit, things that will draw for overnight stays, extend that, extend that visit. If someone's here visiting with their loved ones, give them something they can go and visit and do and extend their stay by a day or so and support overnight activities that'll draw overnight stays, events that'll encourage visitation, efforts that build on that excellence and professionalism, and truly programs that have future potential. That's the incubation that at this table the, the Tourism Development Authority speaks about in which they try to develop activities that haven't previously occurred in Jacksonville so that we can hopefully have them build and do something that is more exciting to people to come here. And among the promotion is to promote those destination events and sports, obviously, because as said, that's a proven matter of, the matter of what's going on here. And collaborate with others. There was a much stated instruction the authority gave was don't duplicate what the county is doing with their money. Don't spend the dime doing the same thing that they're doing and promoting efforts as it is. And, but do fund overnight stay generators and work with the county and the, the people who operate the county tourism on that same effort. And work with the state travel effort. We had the director of state tourism come and speak here. And so we're now partnering with the state um, in, in their effort and to um, also them with us as it is. In doing the strategic execution, one of the things that you know that the authority has done is they've been funded a study that is determined what is the sport or sports that could generate the most overnight stays in a durable and enduring way so that we could have something that potentially we could build a, a, a destination for, a facility that would help make that happen? What would create most overnight stays in an enduring and sustainable fashion? 
The other thing was is obviously fun things, and of course the Tourism Development Authority was one of the first to um, help with the Freedom Fountain and build toward that effort as it was. The Jackson Landing is a great promotional activity and uh, great support. And the Tourism Development Authority at their meeting on June, July 30th is going to consider now starting to help fund some of the money toward building the Visitor Center at this location. And as you know, it's also become a destination of its own where the first event that was held here was a sporting event in which um, we, we generated overnight stays with this speckled trout um, um, shootout as it was. Obviously, um, the burden on the general fund was relieved when the occupancy tax was created so that the remainder of the funding that had been obligated by the City Council for the Vietnam Memorial could be extended and such there. Mm -hmm. And the, the authority has given an amount greater than what was the obligation that the City Council had um, asked for because they helped them fund the last few things that had to do with the dome installation as it was. And something that we're working on strongly now is obviously the Montford Point Marines Memorial um, is under construction now, and we see this as a project that will bring people even next um, in two weeks when the 4th Marine Division has their final muster here. They want to go see the Montford Point Marines, some sort of memorial to them, some sort of actions and connection to them because they fought alongside them at Iwo Jima. And they want that heritage to be played out before they um, close out their effort. And obviously in the Museum of the Marine, again, an obligation that was created by a previous council and now has been assumed by the um, Tourism Development Authority that finished the funding obligation that you had started, and that funding is there. We've also assisted them with promotional activities that can help advance the efforts and fund development for them as it was. We think one of the um, most notable expenses that the authority has done is taken an activity that the Marine Corps Community Services cannot advertise to non-patrons. They are only able to promote their activities now in this new world order um, to patrons aboard the base and at the air station. While using the authorities um, thing, a half marathon that previously had about two to three hundred runners in it now has twelve hundred runners in it. We as a direct response we're seeing hotel rooms filled up as a result of that promotion of that activity. And of course the lure of receive a hero's welcome. Where else can you go and run a race that's aboard a Marine Corps installation and have a Marine hang a medal around your neck? That feeling of a sense of accomplishment, that feeling of something that you've done, of a challenge completed, is a feeling that you can receive as long as you're also having your heroes welcome here in our community. Jazz in the City was an incubation activity that was created because that simply wasn't something that would been, had been done before in the large-scale fashion. And we're hoping with funding this activity that we can grow this into something. It's already gone to a two-night um, function. This picture is of a young lady from Clayton High School who was one of the competitors in the jazz competition that occurred on the Friday night before the event. They're going to do that again, and we're hoping that we can draw this into something that really is a multi-night operation there. Riverwalk Palooza, we have some staff from um, the um, Bold here. That has now had, with the funding that was encouraged by the authority, to do an overdue um, activities that were on the water. Um, with the you know, funding um, incentive to add a river walk, um, a, a river boat um, taxi so you could um, get on the boat at um, the USO and ride down to the um, festival grounds as it was. And of course, Art Block was, um, this was the first time that they've kind of come outside of their doors. Um, it was to bring it on, and we see this, this activity, even on the rainy day that they had it on, show the potential of what this can really be. And so that's um, obviously has been funded for another year. R Winterfest, with all of its fun and family activities as it is, as well as Jamboree with the wonderful operational uh, activities of the rec city recreation folks, that has just been a phenomenal success. And it puts lots of heads on beds with the sporting activities that have occurred as a result of the Jamboree. Um, there's a lot of people who come with the teams that have um, more than one or two members in it, and that's something that really does put heads on beds um, within that activity. Now, expanding on that heads on beds for sporting activity has been the Jax Alonzo Sports Commission. You created that sports commission on August the 10th, 1999. It was your actions that created the nonprofit to put that together. You partnered with the county. Um, the first person was actually hired as a, um, put in the economic development office when that was a county function, and it significantly advanced um, the efforts that have gone there. But I want to just give you a couple things to talk about the last fiscal year that they had, 51 events that they held in there. 
a return of investment of what was paid in to what was out and economic the impact of what was every dollar spent, $123.92. $3,265 room nights were calculated as the generated by activities funded are connected to the Jackson Alonzo Sports Commission. And here's that economic impact. This is not a multiplied number. This is the number estimated by using the National Association of Sports Commission's model of what is saying when a team comes, this many members of the team, they stay at these hotels, they eat these meals, that's the number just for the last fiscal year that occurred in here. And, of course, one of the things that is um, noteworthy is this was an organization you were funding prior to 2010 from the general fund. And now this is an organization being funded by the Tourism Development Authority, which is part of the economic development through the develop through sports is, um, is, is advanced through this effort as it is. Now I want to mention to you quickly the strategic promotion, and that's that one of the things that is at center to what the authority wanted to do was they wanted to see events and festivals and activities in an organized fashion. They wanted to see a media plan developed so that spending could be aggregated among several different organizations and we hire an agency who can place those, those spending so we get the best dollar. They wanted to stay thing, um, mainly targeting overnight stay generations. That is to say, don't buy a lot of advertising locally. Buy the advertising in places where we can hopefully lure people in to come and stay the night in our facilities as it is. And as I mentioned about the unified buys, but we also do cross-promotion. We require those who participate in our events. They have to let the other events that we're funding have places at their, at their activities so they can promote those activities and such there. I mean, after all, that's what, you know, share those experiences as it is there. And, of course, as we meant there from the Jacksonville, uh, using our logo and advancing that effort, that's all part of what it is that we're trying to do is to send that message about how you can receive a hero's welcome. Some of the other things that we're working on now is obviously we'll have some banners um, that we can put up to help um, advance <coughs> that feeling that's going on. Um, we have purchased a year's worth of billboards um, to, to put up the messaging of the city and its branding of its destination. Um, we already have this as a magazine, um, endurance magazine, um, where we're making these placements with the Receive a Hero's Welcome, um, complete the challenge as it is there, and we've got very favorable responses to this as it is. The other area was where the city council years ago asked for some wayfinding to be done. And now with the Tourism Development Authority, you've been able to find an ally with funding for that. And these are just some of the conceptual plans that came out of um, a recent charrette that we had about how we could um, do some branding for the city, the branding for the Receive a Hero's Welcome and do things. These are proposed entrance signs as it was. Here are the district gateways on the left and how you could have some uh, vehicular directional signage that would be in there. Um, and then, of course, the idea would be that you would also have directional signs that are downtown. Now, if you'll notice, they have different caps that are on them because they're proposing that we create districts such as the commons, such as downtown. You know, those type of areas would be developed and, of course, the memorial gardens that we have that we're so proud of. Those would all be districts that would be, um, that we'd help people find their navigation to. And with that district identification, the look and feel would be consistent throughout, the, um, throughout your experience with the visitor. And one of the ones that we're really thinking about is out there at the commons, um, to have a sign that would be on Western Boulevard directing people into the commons, letting them know what's going on inside the commons, what type of activities are there. There's a lot of cars, Anthony tells me, on Western Boulevard. I seem to have to experience most of them when I'm trying to make a left-hand turn somewhere, but they, uh, we know that that's a highly traveled area, and to have something that we could talk about with what's going on in that area would be a wonderful thing. And that, um, Mayor and Council, is, um, is a brief presentation of what the overview is. I do want to just remind you as it is, this is the strategy that the authority has been working on. This is the type of activities they've been trying to, to go with that they've asked us as staff. One of the things that the city managers assigned, obviously, is I serve as staff to the authority. Um, we have some other people that do work with that, Carmen Miracle and, of course, um, John Carter, and I already mentioned Gail Maids also serve as staff to the authority. So I'll turn it back over to the chairman of the authority for and the mayor. Thank you, Glenn. Um, it's, it's interesting having this presentation and looking back, you often get stagnant about, you know, are we getting anywhere? What have we done? And, and looking back, we've done quite a bit over the years. And uh, 
we've had a tremendous team, and, and you and your team have done a, a really phenomenal job. Uh, there's a lot of coordination that goes behind um, the things that we've been able to accomplish. And one of the one of the interesting things for me is that uh, the model that we use for you. Uh, funding some of our activities and bringing those activities, uh, sort of corralling them on how we distribute funds and the process that, that we develop to use, the county is now emulating and using that same, that same program. Uh, so we're very proud of that. Um, but uh, again, we've got a good team. Uh, we still have much work to do. And we continue to uh, look at ways to, to, to do what we do better. But our primary mission is to enhance the quality of life through uh, the activities in which we, we bring to, to the city and promote through uh, festivals and activities, but continue to work towards those capital projects. Because we truly believe that 60% of the people that come here come for their loved ones, but what we want to do is keep them here for an extra day or two or a week. Uh, for that matter, and the more we continue to develop destination points, the more effective we're going to be in doing that. And I think we're already doing some of that. And to continue developing uh, the sports uh, end of it is, a, is another opportunity that we will continue to, to promote and help fund. Um, if there's any questions, uh, that was a great time, but... Let me uh, just add one point. Talking about sports, this past week, Thursday through Sunday, Susan? Yes, sir. We had the basketball, the mm -hmm. East Coast Invitational. Mm -hmm. uh, that put over 300 room nights because of those teams coming in. How many participants did you have? We had 28 teams participate. That's, that's good. So I guess in tying into the, the sports facility, uh, uh, destination study that we've embarked on obviously we're still in, in the infant stage of collecting data but what we're being told is that uh, we're very fortunate in Oslo County to have some amazing facilities uh, soccer and, and basketball or, uh, but we're, we're the opportunity still lies for for more activities uh, of an indoor capability and, and maybe additional outdoor and so that's what we're doing now is sort of building that data so that we can potentially embark in a, a multi-purpose complex uh, of no expense to, to taxpayers is our goal, uh, uh, funding it through the resources that we have uh, in cooperation potentially with the county, uh, making no obligation for the county. But uh, we have a lot of opportunity, and we have a great community, and uh, it's nice to see the work that, that we've been able to accomplish so far, and, and we've got a lot of great things in the future to come, and I think that the citizens will all benefit from that. Well, thank you very much for that report. Mr. Dinner, I thought you had a question. No, it was a great report, great activities. I can see with all that activity going on that the idea of city license plate got lost in a shuffle, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> I thought that was part of our presentation when well, we missed it. And no, we, we, we heard you loud and clear, and we're working on that. Okay. But, uh, well, Dr. Woodruff, if you or staff don't have anything else, we'll go ahead and take a recess now. And, and, uh, and we want to go ahead and go into closed session, <laughs> take your vote during closed session, then we won't have to do anything publicly oh, okay. until you Very come good. out. Entertain a motion to go into closed session. So moved. Second. A second. Any discussion? Here, none. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody.